Well, hello, friends. Good to see you. It's an honor to be at church. Everybody online, thanks for joining in. We're so happy you did this, especially if you're new. We know it takes a lot of courage to tune in, to walk into the building. And so we're just glad you're here, and we hope this is a safe place for you to explore a very dangerous message, okay? The message could change your life. But uh, it's a safe place to investigate that. We are in week four. So we're going to wrap up this series where we're just literally talking about this book. We've tried to address uh, some of the questions that we have. And there's all kinds of questions. And, of course, what we're going to do today and what we've been able to do in the last few weeks, it's just not thorough enough. There's books written on this. But hopefully we're going to address today this one question. How do I actually read this book? Okay, how do I read the Bible? And there are all types of uh, systems that people have. I just want to touch on three really simple things. I'm going to give you to them at the very beginning. Ready? Um, if, you want to, if you want to have a relationship with this book, if you want to read it, I'm going to say, first of all, learn it. <clears throat> Second of all, love it. Third of all, live it. Okay? Learn it, love it, and live it. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, the Bible, by its very nature, is different than most books. How many people in the room or online have you uh, read a Leo Tolstoy book? Anybody? Like War and Peace. There's something about those Russian authors. They don't know how to write a book under like 800 pages, right? Maybe it's the long winters stuck inside for 11 months out of the year or something like that. But they're big. If you're going to read a big book, okay, this is a big book. Typically, how would you read that book? You'd start at the beginning, right? Because it's interesting, like a Leo Tolstoy book, it's written by one author. Maybe it took a few years to do it, but it's one genre of literature. And it's um, like you follow from the beginning to the end. You know, one of the interesting things, I love having conversations with people who are engaging with the Bible for the first time. Sometimes it's people who are brand new to exploring who Jesus is. Um, And then a lot of times... It's people who have been coming to church for a long time. And and like, I know I want to read it, but I don't know how. I don't know where to start. I feel confused when I read it. It's one of the only books where I say, start two-thirds of the way in. (laughs) Right? When people ask me. I say, you know, I think the best place to start would be the New Testament. These are the books that are written after the life of Jesus. Start at Matthew. There's four biographies about the life of Jesus. Because Jesus himself says that the first two-thirds are all about him. And unless I can understand who he is, I probably will have a more difficult time understanding all that came before. So it's a unique book that we oftentimes instruct people to start reading near the end. What else is unique about it? Well, it's not just one author. It's 40 different authors over a period of 1,500 years, 66 books, countless cultures, and multiple forms of genre. And so a third of this book is poetry, Hebrew poetry. And then there's historical and there's um, literature that's meant to be deeply metaphorical. It was a form of communication. So how do we read it? Because here's the problem. Every one of us in the room, we have... Only what we've been dealt with regarding what's between your ears, right? And if I feel confused, I get lost. So how do we read it? I want to walk through three different passages of scripture. And it's from Joshua chapter 1, Psalm chapter 1, and Psalm 119. Just because I think it's a good, it's just a good perspective. It's going to give us kind of the heart of what the scriptures are about and how you read them. And then we'll walk through this, learn it, love it, live it. Okay. Uh, Joshua chapter one, here's the context. Joshua is leading at least a half a million people, maybe far more than this. They've been slaves for 400 years in Egypt. They've been wandering in a desert for 40 years. Now Moses has died. Moses is a fantastic leader. And God comes to Joshua and imagine you're in Joshua's shoes. I've got to lead these hundreds of thousands of people across a river and then to take the promised land. But the promised land is already inhabited with all these tribal groups that don't want to give up their land. And so he's feeling fear, (laughs) uncertainty, like, will people trust me? Moses isn't here. I've been able to rely on him. And God has this beautiful conversation with him. Where he says, Joshua, I don't want you to be afraid, but I'm going to tell you how you can make this happen. Joshua chapter 1. Be strong and very courageous. This and a derivative of this, do not be afraid, is the most repeated phrase in the entire Bible. Over and over. Because human beings 
often find themselves in places of intimidation and uncertainty. And God is constantly saying, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be overwhelmed. You can trust me in the midst of this. So be strong, be very courageous. Be careful to obey. Not just read, not just be familiar with, but put it into action. Obey all the law my servant Moses gave to you. So in order to move towards the future, God says, I want you to obey, to know it, to obey it, to carry out everything that has been given. That would be the first five books of the Bible. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left. Let it be your boundary markers. Let it help you to understand how to actually be fully human, that you may be successful. Here's the first of multiple promises that we're going to read about vitality, success, thriving, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Not just in your ears, but keep it on your lips. There's four Hebrew words used for meditation. Uh, the most popular one, the one used most often, is literally, we would translate it mutter. Mutter. Where you're speaking under your breath to yourself. Not out loud, but you just contemplate. So he says, I want you to keep the scriptures. Just be thinking, muttering them out loud. Meditate. We'll explore that a little bit. On it day and night. A little bit different than just a quiet time. I'm all for like devotional times. But he says, I want this to be thorough and all-encompassing. That There's not just a half hour, an hour in your day where you think about the text. But I want you to just perpetually be stewing over, thinking about the text. So that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. We've got to explore that. What does it mean to be prosperous and successful? Does it mean new trucks for everyone? Right? Good question. Now let's move on to uh, Psalm 1. It's the first Psalm. And it's uh, setting up this imagery of someone who is a student of the scriptures is like a fruitful tree. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight, important word, Delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither whatever they do. Prospers. And that's Psalm 119. By the way, Psalm 119 was an educational psalm. Every uh, portion of the psalm begins with a new letter in the Hebrew alphabet. So the first one begins with an A, Aleph, Bet. And so that was how people could memorize it. This is how Psalm 119 was one of the primary uh, methods used to teach kids how to read and even the alphabet. So it's A, B, C, D, the Hebrew equivalent for each one. We'll just read a portion because the whole psalm is kind of about this theme. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? The question that every parent has asked of their teenager here's the answer by living according to your word I seek you with all my heart do not let me stray from your commands I have hidden fascinating I've hidden your word in my heart there's an internalization that is happening that I might not sin against you praise be to you Lord you Lord, teach me your decrees. With my lips, I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one who rejoices in great riches. So this is interesting, right? He says, okay, the things that you say in the Holy Scriptures, God, it's like, like I have the same sensation as if Publisher's Clearinghouse came to my front door and gave me a million dollar check. Like, there's, some, there's a wealth, there's an engagement, there's an excitement that I receive. Now I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Okay, how do we actually study the Bible? Of course, there's so much that you could do on this. But here's our first word, learn the scriptures. Learn the scriptures. This has to do with our cognitive abilities. This has to do with our mind. And so we, we think... I don't know about you, but I, I grew up in elementary school, especially feeling like I wasn't the sharpest tack out there. I remember my older brother, Jake, 
He's two, oh, my younger brother, Jake, he's two years younger than I am. One night we were doing homework. I was like in fifth grade and he was in third grade. And I realized we're reading the same book. And I knew that I left to go to a special class, but I assumed it was a special class for really smart kids. <laughs> but it turned out it wasn't. He left to go to a special class for smart kids. I left to go to a special class for kids that need extra help. And we're doing the same homework. I was so frustrated. And something entered my mind at that point in my life where I thought, man, Nate, you're not very sharp. Like you're not, and I carried that with me. So when we talk about learning the scriptures, a lot of us feel a little bit insecure. A lot of us feel like I've tried. I really don't know what, like how to read. There is one part of this. There's two parts to learning the scripture. Okay, the first part is my cognitive engagement. So that I seek, you remember we read that? That there is, there's, a, there's a responsibility that I have to open this book and to say, I am pursuing, I am going to engage my mind. Okay, but that's one part. Here's the second part. And the second part is supernatural. The second part has nothing to do with your IQ or your reading comprehension skills. The second part is called revelation. Revelation. And revelation is where I'm presenting myself. God, this is who I am. I'm bringing myself to the text. I'm going to read it. But what I need is someone to teach me and to guide me and to do the supernatural act of, re of revealing truth to me. Now, revelation doesn't happen by itself. It's a partnership. So you cannot, you know, put the Bible under your pillow every night before you sleep and go like, God, tonight, just like, would you just like zip it into my head, revelation all night long. Revelation comes as I say, God, I'm going to read, but I'm a limited, finite human being. And I read this book with the unlimited, infinite God. And as I do my best, would you reveal truth to me? Uh, this week, I was thinking about a friend. He's a dear friend, and he was born with multiple challenges, physical and a few mental challenges. Um, and life's just been a struggle. Like, I just admire his courage. He's forged ahead and one thing I really admire about him is he's a student of this book. Because he understands this. It's not just his ability to read and comprehend. He's an open book. He reads and God teaches. God teaches. So learn the scriptures. I want to give you just five things that have been really helpful to me as I think about learning the scriptures. Okay, you ready? Number one, if we want to read the scriptures, I suggest this. Read slowly. Read slowly. So I, I, like, I can't read quickly. Uh, I know people who can read quickly. I was talking to somebody there at our house yesterday, and we were talking about the books we're reading. And she said, you know, I make my way through a lot of audio books because I listen to them at double speed. You know, where people are like, -ru 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 -ru. I'm like, I need to listen to them at half speed. And then, right? <laughs> so for me, reading slowly, it's not like a sprint. And I also find this, I have a brain that is easily distracted. Anybody else have that? I can be reading the Bible and find myself in the middle of a John Wayne movie I saw 30 years ago. I'm like, how did I get here? Like, I'm reading the Bible and I'm, like, I'm walking through Death Valley right now. Like, what just happened? And so here's what I try to do. I try to read slowly and then I try to read out loud. Okay, just quietly to myself. Because I want to engage as many of my senses as possible. So I'm using my eyes, I'm using my mouth, and then I'm hearing what I'm reading out loud. And it helps me to really, really focus in. Don't do this on an airplane. People think you're weird. But like reading, muttering, repeating it out loud. So read slowly. If you want to learn the scriptures, I'd say ask questions. And this is something we, we sometimes we feel silly, especially if you're brand new in your journey or re, right now you're spiritually unresolved. Like it seems like everybody around you knows, you know, what this phrase means or who that person is in the Bible. Ask questions. Find people that are just a little bit ahead of you. Ask questions. People love to, to dialogue about the Bible and ask questions of God, right? I have spiral notebooks. When I read the Bible, I write down. Okay, I probably, I don't know. I've been doing this for years. I have dozens of these full spiral notebooks. And I bet you 50% of everything that's in those notebooks are questions. Things I just don't really get. And so I say, God, 
uh, says this, and I'm not really sure. Like, could you help me understand this? Ask questions. Third step, if you want to learn the Bible, would be read with your tutor. We've emphasized this over the last several weeks. That the Spirit of God was involved in the writing of the Scriptures, and the Spirit of God is always involved in the reading of the Scriptures. So there's two miracles that happen. One is this book. The second miracle that happens is you just don't want to read this book alone. You don't want to rely on your own cognitive abilities. Read this book and say, God, I'm about ready to read the Scriptures. I need the tutor, the spirit who came to remind me of everything Jesus taught and who promises to teach me all things, to be in this moment present, that when I read, this is more than just my mind's engagement. This is the spirit of God actually teaching me. And then if you want to learn the scriptures, remember the original listeners. And this is, this can be really challenging, but here's what we do. Like we all do this. We can't help it. We're Westerners with a specific mindset and we're living in the year 2022, okay? And so whenever we read the text, here's the first question that we ask. What does this mean to me, right? What does this mean to me? Well, some of what we're reading is thousands of years old and the better question to ask is first, before what it means to me, what did it mean to them? To them, the original readers or the original listeners. And from that, it helps us. So that's the idea of context. I'm going to show you this really brief graphic and like we're barely going to touch on it. But in your notes, if you grab notes or you want to downline, download notes online, I have five recommended books and this website. This is from Brad Gray. He's uh, one of the finest young theologians I know in the American church today. He'll be with us in March, by the way. It, you'll, you're going to love what he has. So he says this, when it comes to context, what did it mean to the original listeners? Here's your text. There's a historical setting for everything you read in the Bible. There's cultural settings. Uh, Middle Eastern cultures are radically different than ours. There's geographic. Uh, the Bible takes place in mountains and valleys and all these different places, certain uh, geographic areas. There's a visual that God is often like, Jesus teaches outside almost all the time. He says, look at the birds of the air. And he's literally outside, like, look at those birds, look at the lilies, look at the flowers. He's looking at that. Linguistic, there are a lot of linguistic issues and literary. There's all these genres represented. And so ask yourself, before, before we ask ourselves, what does this mean to me? What did this mean when it was originally written? And then the next step into how do you learn the Bible is create a ritual. Create a ritual. It's just a point of intentionality, Right? Now, what we read said, I think about it day and night, but anybody consider themselves a uh, procrastinator? Okay. Yeah, some of us are like, I'm not sure. I think I should raise my hand, but you like half hour now. Yep, definitely. Okay. I, I think all of us deal with that in one way or another. And, and there's always like, I'll, I'll do it later today. Or I just think there's something beautiful to creating a ritual where I have an appointment with God. And, and that's how I want, I don't just want to think about it as a devotional time, but I have an appointment with God where the Holy Spirit is going to meet me and he's going to teach me out of his word. And I, I'm not going to be late for that appointment, right? I'm going to show up and he's going to show up. So one final thing in this whole idea of learning the scriptures, there are, I have bad news for you, okay? There are a lot of passages in the Bible that I, I do not really understand. Anybody else have those? Yeah, you read it and you're like, head scratcher. Here's a tendency, is that if we're moving through our life, just following Jesus, we get to something that we read and we don't understand that, and it's very easy to get obsessed with that thing. Like if I can't figure this out, well how can I move forward? I just make this recommendation. There are some things in the Bible that are really difficult to understand. There are hundreds, if not thousands of things in the Bible that are easy to understand. And so I don't wanna just focus on the things that are hard to understand. I wanna focus on the things that are clear, but incredibly challenging. Like where Jesus says, I want you to actually love your enemies. I can't go, well, I don't understand that. I can't ask, how do I do that? 
And I, I just love this. Uh, Stan and Ginger Simmons were here last night at our service. They were sitting right there. And they pastored this church for 36 years. And like, he's just a, a beautiful Bible student. And I looked at him and I said, Stan, are there any parts of the Bible that are difficult for you to understand? And he just nodded his head like this. And we could look at that and go like, nuts. <laughs> After all this time. But here's what I love. I find this. If there are these things that are challenging, I write them down. I ask questions and I move ahead. And there's this amazing passage in the book of John where Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And he says this. He says, there are many more things that I want to teach you. But you don't currently have the capacity to understand them. But eventually, I'll be able to teach them to you. Because I'm bringing my finite mind and my experiences and all of my predispositions to the text, there are just things that I don't understand, but this is my prayer and this is what I've experienced in my life. I'll move forward with the things that I do understand and I'll go back and I'll be like, oh my goodness. Finally, I've gotten to a point of maturity where I can bear this teaching. I can understand it. And that's why I love that you can, we can be 90 years old and still be on this tremendous adventure with this book. If I could understand everything in this book, I'd be disappointed in this book. Because I have a finite mind, I'm a finite human being, and I am reading the writings of an infinite God. So there are things that are so far beyond me, but it's this beautiful adventure. When I was a kid, um, we would drive from out of, out of town, we kind of lived in the country, we'd drive into town and then we'd spend the whole day in town, go to church. And I don't know, I bet for, I don't know, six months, maybe a year. And at the afternoons, we would go visit this sweet old lady. I do not remember her name, but I think she was probably in her 90s, mid 90s when we'd go visit her. And she had lost a pretty much all short-term memory. You know, like we'd introduce ourselves to her every week and, and she was just so pleasant, but she just couldn't remember like, did I eat lunch or will I eat lunch? All that was gone. But there was this, I'll never forget this. My dad would just quote the first three or four words out of, I, I don't even know how many passages of the Bible. Like, blessed is the man. And she would, even though she had this extreme cognitive decline, she would jump in and she'd finish pretty much any verse that you could imagine. So although her short-term mind wasn't working, there was something in her. She had been such a learner of the scriptures. In the midst of this instability in her life, she was like, she was on the bedrock. The bedrock of the scriptures. You could sing an old hymn, just start it off, and she'd just finish it out. It was deep within her. That's what it means to be a learner of the scriptures, okay? So number one, how do we read the Bible? We learn, we learn. It's a partnership between my being intentional, my reading, and the spirit of God supernaturally teaching me. Number two, love the scriptures, love the scriptures. So the first has to do with our head. This has to do with our heart. How do we love the scriptures? Because we read it and you could read a dozen places where it says, I take great delight in your word. So you know how, uh, what kindergarten would have looked like in an ancient Hebrew society? Um, some, some groups still do this. So before there was paper, in order to teach the Hebrew alphabet, you'd oftentimes have a big wooden board with Aleph, Bet, all the Hebrew letters, okay? Now here's what you would do on your first day of kindergarten. Because this was your textbook, by the way, all right? And oftentimes it would start with Psalm 119. Is the rabbi, before all the kids arrived, would come to this big board of the Hebrew alphabet and he would take honey and he would smear each letter in honey. Okay, this is not COVID friendly. This is a century old practice. And then when the kids came in, it's like kindergarten. This is four or five years old. He would say to each one of the kids, he'd say, may the words of God be like honey on your lips. And the kids would come up one at a time and lick the honey off the letter. And here's what he was trying to teach them. Would there be this level of anticipation and excitement and engagement that when you read this book, it's not monotony. It's not 
rote, it's not habitual, but would there be this delight that you have every time you open the book? And in many Hebrew churches today, here's what they'll do, they just use honey sticks, it's a little bit more sanitary, and before they teach the kids, take your honey stick, and would the words that God speaks bring you delight? How many of you guys like delight in chocolate? Just like, I said the word and you're like, mm-hmm, right? Like you can have it. I do not like chocolate. And I know some of you just love, love, love chocolate. My um, gal that helps organize several of our lives, she has candy. Her name's Kelsey. She has candy in her office. And I have to walk through her pile of chocolate on my way out every time I leave or come into my office. And it's no problem. I'm just like, Pfft. but then I watch people. They, they can't see me. But I can look through a window and they're coming in and like grabbing chocolate. And you like, it looks like addiction, right? And they're just like, mm. <laughs> Okay, I don't have that, but cinnamon, <laughs> hot tamales, cinnamon bears, good Lord. I, Jenny asked me the other day, she said, hey, can you stop at the convenience store and get some milk? And it just started in my mind, like, oh no, convenience store, they're going to have hot tamales. I'm going to <laughs> I'm gonna have to walk past them to grab the milk. Don't look at them, don't look at them, because like I don't eat one or two. I'm going to finish the whole stinking box. Right? Why? There's this engagement, this anticipation. And interestingly, that's what the scripture is saying. Can I, can I just love it? It is so easy. I want to speak especially to the veterans, those of us who have been around for a while, those of us who have read the Bible. You can get to this place where our, our, our passion for, our delight in the scripture begins to fade and if I want to have a dynamic relationship with God in the scriptures, there always needs to be this level of, man, what I'm about to read is beautiful. I crave it. Would it be sweet on my lips? The difficult things that I read that challenge my perspective, challenge my ethics, would there still be this deep, beautiful sense of anticipation? Now, one other element of this love of the scriptures we have to talk about meditation. So we read that over and over, and I just wanna make a, a distinction because I think in our culture, when we think of meditation, we've actually adapted into our culture more of an Eastern form of meditation. And so in the Eastern form of meditation, you have two primary goals. The first is to empty your mind. Okay, so you try to, you're pausing and you're trying to empty your mind. And then you second, focus internally. Okay, so you empty your mind and you focus internally. Biblical meditation, when we read that word, please know it is very different. Your first goal is to fill your mind. Okay, so I'm trying to fill my mind with truth. I'm trying to fill my mind with what I'm reading. And then I'm not focusing internally. I am focusing externally upon God. And the Bible over and over instructs us to meditate. So there's four biblical words, Hebrew words for meditate. I'll just talk about two. The first is mutter. This is used the most often. Where I am, instead of just reading and hoping it's inside, I'm muttering. I'm asking questions. I'm repeating it over and over. It's a form of meditation. And here's the second uh, word for meditation. It's the exact same word that you use if you throw a dog a bone. And what does a dog do to that bone? meditates on that thing, right? We have two dogs. One is 13 years old, is toothless, is blind, is deaf. Every morning he's laying on the couch and I'm like, are you alive? Are you alive? Yep, he's alive. One more day, get him outside. And my other dog is a Springer Spaniel who's just like, ah, you know, just, you throw that dog a bone, just work it, work it, work it. That's what the word meditate means. Is that you just chew on it over and over. You just like, it's an obsession. And you're trying to break it down so that it can be absorbed. I've hidden your word in my heart. I don't want to deal with the scripture at an exterior level. But I want to actually love it so that it seeps deep within my life. So we learn the scriptures. And then there's this ongoing challenge to love the scriptures. Right? That it doesn't become monotonous. You love them. And then here's the third and final thing, if you want to be a Bible student, is to live the scriptures. To live the scriptures. And this is absolutely important because the challenge is we can learn them and we can love them, but maybe never do them. 
So if you didn't hear anything else today, I would just say this. Please understand that Christianity is more than just a philosophy. A philosophy is a way that I view the world, the way I put things together and understand the world. Over and over, the Bible doesn't just say, hey, learn my truth. It says, put it into action. Put it into action. So that's where I begin to obey. This is what I do with my hands. It's my head, it's my heart, and now it's my hands. And Jesus goes on and on in so many of his teachings to talk about this. One example, Matthew. He says, I want to tell you a story about two people who built houses. They're like the identical houses. But one doesn't have a foundation, and the other has a foundation. And both will be fine until the storm comes. And when the storm comes, the house without the foundation will be destroyed. The one with the foundation will survive. And then we miss this, but he says, he says the one who has a foundation is the one who hears my words and puts them into practice. They actually live it out. So my goal isn't to become a Bible theologian. My ultimate goal is to become obedient to the scriptures. And all these crazy challenging areas when it comes to finances, when it comes to human sexuality, when it comes to my ethics, that I might know what it says, but I want to do what it says. I actually want to put it into practice. And then these beautiful promises. What does Psalm say? You'll be like a tree. A tree planted by streams of living water which yields its fruit in season and you don't ever wither. Why? Because you have this dynamic relationship with God's words and you're learning it, you're loving it, and you're living it and there's a fruitfulness in your life. In Joshua, Psalm 119, what do we read? You'll be prosperous. You'll be successful. Psalm 119 says, your path will be illuminated. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean new cars and houses for everyone? No, it doesn't. It means this. That as I live out the text, that I'll be in this place of contentment. This place of peace. This place of prosperity. Now, it could mean, it could mean that God blesses you financially. I hope that for everybody in the room. But in order to be prosperous and successful, it doesn't mean that you have to be wealthy. Is that I'm in this place where I've learned the scriptures, I'm learning the scriptures, I'm loving the scriptures, I'm living the scriptures out. That there's this profound sense of contentment and peace. And I'm right where I'm supposed to be. I'm finding what it truly means to be a human being. As we move ahead, this whole year I'm excited. We're going to study all the threads, as many as possible, of the Bible. I always have a fear, okay? The way that we do church and the way you guys so graciously tune in, show up, and you let me teach the Bible to my best of my ability. My job is to learn the scriptures, to love the scriptures, and to live the scriptures. If I, don't, I don't, if I don't live them out, I'm simply a theoretician and Christianity is only a philosophy. But I have this added in one. I'm supposed to teach the scriptures. But every single person, I don't care how new you are, I don't care how long you've been around, we have the same assignment to be someone who learns who loves, who lives, who loves the scripture, learns the scripture, lives out the scripture. That's, that's how the world changes. Where we put it into practice. Where I pick up this book and I'm saying, God, I have so many questions, but would you teach me? And I pray, I pray this, I pray, I pray that your tutor meets you. And I pray that he reveals things that I would never see. That he teaches you and leads you into all truth. And we become this profound community of people who are Bible students. 
and Bible doers. We learn it, we love it, we live it.